Hi everyone, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the following podcast belong solely to the host and its contributors. They are not necessarily the views of our employers, organizations, committees, or other group or individual. Welcome everybody to another episode of Bring With Bim. I'm Joe Whitney, and with me is Dave Campbell. What's up, Dave? Hey, not much, Joe. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. Doing well. Uh, how's it feel for you, dude? You're, uh, you're back in your, your home now, man, right? Ah, you know, yeah, it feels, uh, feels pretty nice. I mean, it's still kind of tired adjusting to everything, right? But feels nice to be back home. It really does not bouncing around. Although I, I will tell you, I do miss, uh, do miss that pond over at my, my mother-in-law's house there. <laughs> it was a uh, nice backdrop for the podcast. What about the mosquitoes that came with it, man? Oh, no. Yeah, I do not miss those. <laughs> or the little, like, flesh-eating gnats that they seem to have out there. Uh, now, they're not really flesh-eating, but they, they just they fly all over you, and they do bite. Some of them bite. And no. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. All no, right, I'm, man. I'm glad to be away from that. I, I think I uh, spent more money in DEET than, <laughs> than <laughs> I have <laughs> a long time, like on, on more, more than most things I would normally spend money on. <laughs> well, now you got to came home and spend even more money. I heard you had some trouble when you got to your house, uh, some pet oh. problems. Oh, dude. Yeah. It's been a, it's been, it's been one of those weeks, man. I, uh, you know, we, we drive four days across country and that was an awesome trip. You know, we, we stopped in, um, Stopped in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Then we went on to, um, oh, Mile City, Montana. Stopped there. And then our next stop was Wallace, Idaho, before our final leg here. So definitely some awesome scenery. Got to experience some of the towns. Like Wallace, Idaho was awesome. Great experience. But uh, then we get home. And, you know, you're, I don't know, you're mixed feelings. Like, ah, oh, finally home. You walk in the door only to smell cat pee like whoa <laughs> wait a minute yeah like that's <laughs> babe we're gonna go not back what to i wanted I just leave yeah this, hang on a second realize. can i just pause reset on this and let's go ahead and walk in it smells nice right no so we go in right first thing i do is i go down to the basement because that's where the cat's litter boxes were and uh, man, I just, <laughs> there's cat litter everywhere, turds all over the floor. They peed on the couch downstairs. And I was like, all right, well, that sucks, but at least it's just the couch. You know, I can toss that out, whatever. I go upstairs, you know, and I'm like, all right, let's, let's take our clothes to our bedroom. And of course, in my bed, the cats had uh, used my bed as a litter box as well. Uh, and my youngest son's bed. Uh, and they, yeah. Just man, they were uh, pretty upset with us. I guess, I guess, for being gone for a while. Um, so yeah, time for new mattresses. Woo yeah, you know, it's so funny. Uh, yeah, I just, I just ate that pill yesterday. Um, that was a, that was kind of a hard one to swallow. You know, I mean, I, it, it seemed like I was doing so well in my savings account until I get back home, and then I'm like. There goes fifteen hundred dollars. All right. Oh, you got off cheap. Fifteen. I did get off, right. dude. I, you know, honestly, there's a mattress place right in town. Adrian and I went during lunch one day and just kind of went around laying on these different beds, and uh, we were trying to stay under a thousand dollars, and that's just for our bed, which was, you know, okay, cool. Um, this guy down at the bed store, you know, he's kind of talking us through the different beds. I told him I had back surgery. I have hip problems. And Adrian and I, uh, we, we spoon, we cuddle. So <laughs> it, our current bed, dude, it, it, the problem with it, even before we left, was every time you went to lay in the bed, you'd roll towards the center. Just each side was just there. And it's oh. like nothing I could do to get away from her even when I was hot. I'm like, no, I need So space. you had like uh harder supports on the outside but the inside was a little bit softer yeah yeah because we had one of those foam mattresses and i think yeah. it just yeah so um it was about that time anyways but we, we went in this bed kind of talking to him and uh you know he, he's showing us these different beds and uh we ended up getting it down to like two a serta and another one i think it was a or sealy i think it was sealy and another one, I think it was a Sealy, but it was the uh, like the eye comfort or whatever it is. And the guy's like, oh, this is top of the line. I'm looking at it. And I'm like, that says twenty seven hundred dollars on sale. I, I'm, I'm cool. Like that seems like an amazing bed. Right. But way out of my price range. 
And I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking something more like this one over here. It's, you know, it's a floor model, 30% off. It's like 800 and some dollars. I'm like, that seems like right in my budget, right? And uh, the guy's like, look, if you want this bed, I'll cut you a huge deal on it because I have the brand new model I just got and I want to get this one off my floor. He's like, I'll sell it to you for $800. I'm like, huh sold all right you know? <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah we ended up you know checking it out it has that cooling technology which of course i'm i'm hoping lasts for longer than the first like 30 days but <laughs> you know it is what it is uh, you don't really notice it after you put sheets in the mattress protector and everything it, like that on it is it foam or is it the hybrid one with the springs in the foam um i think this one is a, a hybrid it might be a hybrid or all foam. It might because he he showed us this like book thing, and there was like carbon fiber foam, cooling foam, memory foam, and some other type of foam. Okay, and, but he didn't show you the coil packs in it, so then no, it's it's, yeah. it's it's all foam. Cool. Yeah, it's probably all foam. Um, and it's it's you know slept on it last night, and the thing is uh, that I really like about it is it seems like it's firm. Like you kind of sink into it just a little bit, but it keeps you in place. So even like I, I get up at three, four times at night at least. And, um, you know, I'll just have to roll over. I'll have to get up, go pee, what have you. Um, and usually I wake Adrian up because I move the whole, you know, the bed moves. Last night, she did not wake up at all, dude. I'm telling you what, like I, nice. I get up in bed, she is snoring. She's out. I, like when she got up, I didn't notice. It's just a, it's a nice, nice improvement. Yeah. It's nice, man. Yeah. Um, you know, there are three things that you shouldn't cheat butt on uh, if you have the money, right? Um, shoes, tires, and beds. Yep. The three things that uh, a colleague of ours actually taught, you know, we talked about this is anything that you put between you and the grounds is worth spending money on. So shoes, tires, and bed. Yep. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't go too expensive on shoes, but uh, I do drop some money. Mm -hmm. um beds man like i was i've been stuck with you know cheap mattresses forever it's i grew up poor you know i'm yep, yep. Uh, even even though you know i've got a little tucked away i still uh i'm just that frugal it's just you know you know just frugal this last go round uh when we moved into this house the wife was like all right well, let's 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 get a nice mattress mm -hmm. and we you know we went during memorial day last year or something like that one of the holidays whatever and Got them down, but we got one of the hybrid mattresses, so it's the coils and the spring, so it's stiff yeah. enough, but um, still has a little bit of that foam. I didn't get cooling technology. That would have been that would have been pretty nice. That yeah, been, yeah, yeah, man. So uh, here we are on uh, Brewing with Bim, where we talk about Bim beer and beds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Well, speaking of the beer part, man, uh, what do you got over there, bud? I just saw you take All a right. sip. Some. I did. I couldn't wait any longer. I've been waiting. Oh, but... I've been chugging the whole time. <laughs> Uh, this week, kind of as a celebration, I uh, went to the store and picked up uh, beer from one of my favorite breweries, Deschutes, and oh, nice. I saw that they had um, a Fresh Haze IPA. So instead of the Fresh Squeezed, it's a Fresh Haze IPA, which, dude, I am always down for a Fresh Hazy IPA. Like, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, man. That seems to be the, the, the theme now is everybody's on these, these Hazy IPAs. I use a Werlock tablet, Werf, Werflock tablets, Werflock, I can't say it right, tablets to um, separate the beer. It kind of you know, does something to the proteins, okay. um, so it comes out clearer. But uh, I think if you don't do that, you end up with something like this hazy IPA. So I've got the Brewdog hazy like I had last time. Oh, yeah, uh, Werflock, Whirlflock. Yeah, yeah, I use those. I use about a half tablet for a five-gallon. Uh, but then I, I got the mix pack of the brew dog. I saw it at the store and I was like, yoink, mine. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in it, they had this one, which is a punk IPA. Oh. It's like an English style uh, IPA. It's kind of got that flatter taste, uh, more fruit, um, mm -hmm. sweet, but not too sweet. But it, I don't know. It's I, I feel like it's got the right bitters for a good West Coast IPA, but still, I don't know. It, it does remind me of an English style beer, so it's really okay. good. I like it. Heck yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, and they closed uh, a lot of the bars and everything are starting to close around here again. Um, by order of uh, governor and mayor and all that fun stuff. So I'm just trying to get alcohol where I can. <laughs> yep, yep. You know what's funny is you know what that means? That just means that we need to start putting more effort towards brewing. <laughs> the uh, more that yes. they, we go towards prohibition times. It's like, oh, no, let's, yeah, let's go ahead yeah. and learn how to do this at home. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I keep meaning to do this. I'm, I'm actually going to dedicate some time this weekend. I've got all the videos recorded. I just got to do a write up and uh, get all my links. But uh, I've got five gallons in my garage right now that I brewed um, two weeks ago. It'll be two weeks this weekend. Nice. So I'll be ready for, I'll be ready for kegging uh, this weekend. And then probably next weekend, I'll start jumping into it and drinking it. Um, but uh, yeah, man, it's a Citra IPA. All right. Nice uh, hoppy, got some some grapefruit notes in it. So we'll see see how that came out. Um, yeah, dude. I recorded you know snippets of the process, so I'll post that up on our page too. It'll be All interesting. Right. I noticed you got some artwork behind you, man. Oh yeah, dude. Actually, uh, this I, I think I told you about. Oh wait, these two. Yeah, these are, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, these two. I thought you were like this one. Yeah, I don't care one about the favorites. real artwork, man. Yeah, uh, these two right artwork. here. Yeah, I love it, man. My uh, my son drew me a picture of uh, me and him on a boat, and we were fishing on a boat. And then my daughter drew me a cat because she loves cats. Even after, <laughs> even week, after, then? yeah. Oh, I'm not too well send it. Actually, one of my cats is like a lap dog. He's he sits at my feet. So this is my office too. This is where I work. Mm -hmm. um, he sits right here on my floor. Like I've got this foam mat down here. And he just yeah. lays there all day like a like a lap dog, man. That's awesome. I actually yeah. got my uh, my male dog, well, Diego. He's a Rottweiler, like, shepherd, chow mix. He actually sleeps kind of right next to me. all those mutts, man. Yeah, he's a mutt. <laughs> he's a mutt. I love it. I'm a mutt. Your dog's a mutt, man. <laughs> We're all mutts. Hey, I got uh, – he, he sleeps down on my side usually, um, which kind of makes it weird because I can't roll my chair around too much. I'm afraid of rolling into him. He's a good-sized dog, like 70 po 75 pounds. And then uh, Sophie – the uh, new edition uh, cat that we got like before we left, actually, uh, a few weeks before we left. She's my uh, other office companion. She sleeps. I have this like shelf next to me with like my shadow box and, and my flag and, and some Peyton Manning pictures. Right. Got to put the man up there and uh, <laughs> I got to put my Peyton Manning up there. Is, is, it, is it Colts or Broncos? Oh, it's they're both Colts. They're both oh, Colts. Yeah. I mean, I would. I, I'm honestly, I, I would. I would rock anything from Peyton Manning uh, in, in the Denver Broncos jersey too. That dude is the man. <laughs> but uh, Sophie actually sleeps right on top of that cabinet, and it's funny because every once in a while, just when she wants attention, she'll come down and then crawl on my desk, like put her face in my face. And like rub on me and stuff earlier. Acknowledge me. Yeah, exactly, dude. We were doing that uh, dry run earlier, and she just comes over and walks on my keyboard. And I'm like, oh no, Sophie, I'm gonna set you down. Jumps right back up. Gets oh, right. <laughs> yeah, our dry run. Everybody, well, this will be posted after it, but uh, check out it. It'll be on our uh, work YouTube page and our work stuff. We'll be doing uh, our last of the APL series in Navis Works. Yep. Yep, yep. Now we start, man. 60 layout. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to that, man. I finally got my phone to pair up with my uh, computer. Uh, nice. Good old technology there. Yeah. Keeps yeah. throwing me for a loop. It, it just keeps changing. Like, I have the Surface Pro. It worked one way. I get a new computer. It doesn't work the same way. I have to get some apps. Stupid stuff. I don't know. It is what it is. Yeah. But, it's always uh, a learning experience, man. I think with anything that you get into, even anything new or anything even, let's say, not brand new, but something different to you. Yeah. It always takes that kind of time to figure out, okay, this doesn't work as well with this computer. Let me find something else and what's there. Also yeah. opens your eyes to new applications instead of staying like focused in one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this app that I just found was pretty dang awesome. Like, uh, I, I, um, I like screenshot a lot of stuff. I do a lot of stuff on my phone. Like, mm -hmm. um, that I'll end up sending myself in a work email later. Like I email it to myself. Yep. And with this, I just literally connect it to my computer and it's called Samsung Flow. And not only can I, um, you know, get all my notifications on my computer and do all the, and actually use my computer, use my phone through my computer and vice versa. Um, it'll actually like, I can share files back and forth and stuff. So it's yeah. pretty cool. 
Yeah. Heck yeah, man. You know, it's, this is uh, pretty perfect. I think it's um, pretty historic that one of our tangents actually segues into our topic of the day. But, you know, we were talking about how applications, to push, man. Yeah, we're yeah. pushing applications uh, or using applications, external applications to push what we can do. And we were going to focus today on uh, external applications for Revit, like pushing those BIM workflows and um, really pushing that program to do some things it can't do natively, but we need it to do. Yeah. So before we get started on that, uh, let's set the set the boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. We're not saying these are the greatest Revit plugins. We're saying that these are the plugins that we seem to see the most or utilize the most. Yeah. And the second caveat to that is we will not be uh, reviewing any reseller plugins. Uh, if a reseller, if it's branded as a reseller, anything, we don't want to. We don't want to jump down that rabbit hole. Uh, there are a lot of uh, resellers with the great applications. Uh, it's just, it's not worth it. Um, but that said, some of the ones that are on our list may be white labeled as reseller, you know, whatever. Yeah. It's just, yeah. The You're going to have that. Exactly. Yeah. The, you, you have some really, really good tools. Uh, people want to help push that out. So, I mean, that, that is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I got my list here on my, on the phone and I know we share this Google keep app. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we should start in the realm of, Virtual reality, man. How do you Ooh. think about that? All right. I think that's good, man. I mean, honestly, I think that is a big, uh, well, big and kind of up and coming, not up and coming. You know, I mean, it, it's well, it's developing it, more. Yeah, I would say that it's like rendering and all that stuff, like high-end rendering, especially for kicking out to visual, uh, to um, uh, virtual reality, AR, all that sort of stuff. Like, it, it's not commonplace by any means. But at the same time, it's not like uh, it's not on the fringe anymore. It's no. it is becoming more mainstream. Yep. Um, I actually had a call with one of them today, and they're on our list uh, just just because I checked them out. I haven't actually played with it, but the stuff I saw maybe want to put them on this list and bring them up. Um, so first up, uh, Enscape. Right? We can't talk oh, about yeah. rendering and and not talk about VR Enscape. and all that stuff without Enscape. They yeah. literally are, you know, one of the top ones out there. Um, yeah. I know so many A and E firms that use it. Um, it is, you know, pretty ubiquitous. It is, it is very awesome. It is a great tool. Uh, put applying materials, applying animations. Like I, I, I think I, I was looking at one model, and it was kind of uh, it was like a man cave, and they had like TVs going. They had a pinball machine and like different lights that would go up and like under the bar and stuff, and it was just a fantastic rendering made you really feel like you're standing in this room or like it was just an exciting like you look at it uh from my aspect i'm a gamer or i used to be at least i i was much heavier into gaming you know <laughs> than i have been lately but you know you get into some of these games and you get kind of sucked in and, and you want to play you want to check things out i feel the same about these renderings that i look at from enscape like this is a walkthrough i want to go through i'm like this is cool let's check this out yeah, yeah, I'm. I, I hear you, man. It, it does actually look like something you would see in a high end game. Uh, yep. First of all, when you said um, I used to be into gaming, all I could think of was uh, Cartman. Uh, <laughs> man, more cheesy piss, man. Yeah, more cheesy piss. Hot pockets, man. <laughs> Beefcake. <laughs> oh man, that episode where they're all playing—I don't know—it was World of Warcraft oh, or World something. World of Warcraft, yeah, dude. Yeah. Oh gosh. That's that a great episode. Yeah. Oh man, me too. Me too. They're still going strong. I just uh Yeah, I kind of fell off the wagon a little bit since I got kids. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> you know, like there's so many shows, there's so much time you have after the kids go to bed that yep. you can dedicate to inappropriate things. It's like, is South Park the one that I'm gonna watch tonight? Probably not. Sometimes maybe you see an episode on, you know, and you're like bored, don't have anything to. Yeah, okay, let's watch South Park. Or you see bigger, longer, and uncut is on. Yeah, I'm oh probably gonna gosh. go ahead and watch. That. I I can quote that maybe <laughs> front to back. Um, it, it's it's truly a, a great movie. The I don't know the the thing for me though is like my after my kids go to bed. Mm -hmm. That's when I'll start watching the gory stuff, you know, the oh yeah, the fighting, the cursing. Yeah, there might be a little bit of nudity, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, I think last episode I was telling you about the show called Kingdom. I watched all three seasons, 
40 yeah. freaking episodes, dude. I just, I just marathon it, man. No matter what I was doing, it was playing in the background. It was, it was, they yeah, did awesome. such a good job at, um, I'll have Captain, to check that you know. out, man. I was dude. addicted to, uh, Game of Thrones, like everybody else there for a long time. I held off. I will tell you, I held you off your Game of basic Thrones. basic white dude. Dude, that, that show was amazing. That's in the basic white dude starter <laughs> that kit, That is man. cool. Game I am there. I am all <laughs> over it. You can give me dragons. I am on it. Oh, dude. man. So speaking of rendering, I just uh, I wanted to pull up some of the um, ones that I saw for Lumion because we were talking oh, about yeah. the renderings. For... Oh, my gosh, man. They look like real life. Like yep. uh, Lumion, so um, I mean that's probably a good segue into the next one. If we're still talking about um, rendering and all that sort of stuff, Lumion, man, that's that's another great one. It is. I like I I, I like Lumion a light a light a lot. Uh, I like Lumion a lot. I like um, it. A lot. I like it a lot for these uh, rendering capabilities and and kind of like I almost want to say like the light studies that you can kind of see from inside of it. Um, well, utilizing it, right, and, and being able yeah. to kind of see how it's going to hit the materials, how it's going to affect, or how it's really going to show the room or the uh, the model you're walking through. Yeah, man. Um, you know, I'm looking looking at the complete setup. It's been so long since I've actually had a, you know, you know they have automatic Lumion. model importing into Lumion, so you don't need to separately import a model in. Oh, dude. The Real atmospheric, the atmospheric conditions for rain and snow, it That's looks, cool. it looks like, um, it looks legit, it looks real. That's great. That is cool. Definitely an awesome plugin. I, I, I agree with you there. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's come a long way in like the three, four years since I've actually like had to do much with it. But I do see it everywhere. You know, most most people's machines that I remote in and help them out or. Mm -hmm. or we're chatting about stuff, uh, Lumion comes up quite a bit. Um, this next one on our list is one that I run into quite a bit. I haven't touched it in about a year and a half, but uh, had a chance to uh, look into it with uh, HoloLens, and um, I got to say, man, it's phenomenal. Uh, Visual Live 3D. Yep, yep. Um, you know, in the early days when we were talking about, like, pushing models to uh, a headset, uh, not just VR, but AR, like, it was such a complex workflow. We'd first have to go to 3DX Max, 3DS Max, um, and then output that way. What Visual Lab 3D did is they came in with this plugin, and it was it was just like a one click to to Revit That's or one click to Revit. Yeah, yeah. Um, wait, what would you say? Hollow Live. Is that what you were saying? No, no, no. Um, hollow. Ho wait, what? Hollow Live. It's so Hollow Live. Live is the um, it works with the Navisworks and Revit plugins that allows you to push um, CAD or BIM um, models into the Hololens. Oh no, this is actually um, no, that's not what I was talking about. This is actually inside of Visual Live 3D. It's part of their exporter. Visual Live. I mean, it might use the Hollow Live. I don't know Hollow Live um, engine or something, but. Um, it is Hollow Live. You're right. I didn't know that's what it's called. David, the man. <laughs> yeah, it just when inside of Revit, it's just the Visual Live Revit plugin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the plugin um, that pushes it to Hollow yeah. Live, right? And then, oh, jeez. All right, man. Yeah, um, and that one was so cool. Uh, we were chatting with a bunch of mechanical firms that wanted to be able to like you know, lay out, but do a bunch of QAC, QAQC type of stuff, uh, workflows where they'd kind of orient themselves and uh, kind of get a good lock. We talk about this type of workflow when we talk about like Verity, where we're comparing designs to as built. Well, it's kind of similar where we're overlaying uh, the model uh, with the headset. The issue is there's always been like this drift issue that we had to fix. Mm -hmm. um, Visual Live has got a pretty good handle on, on a lot of things and they seem to uh, do do pretty great with that, though. Like, it's not not too big of a deal. Yeah. Um, uh, this other one, that, oh, and actually, a contractor that we worked with in the past, um, they got a grant to use it on a project, and they said that like within like the first like three weeks of you know using it on a project, they found like thirty or forty thousand um, uh, dollars in savings just by yeah. using it on the projects like you that's guys awesome. got this for free and save like 30 or 40 grand I and mean, come yeah, on yeah. yeah 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 it's pretty nice 
usage case um, is there. It is there. It is there. Um, another one is the Wild. So this is the company I chatted with earlier today. Um, the Wild isn't one that I had ran into too much, although several of our customers, if you go to the website, use it. Um, and uh, I chatted with the gentleman today. They're actually based in your neck of the woods. They're based out of uh, Vancouver, Washington, also known as Van Tucky. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know why, but that's what everybody calls Vancouver, Washington, nice. is Van Tucky. Like yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're up there. It's, uh, it was one of the more unique uh, VR apps I've seen. I, you know, I play with a lot of fun, fun VR apps, but um, this one in particular um, allowed multiple people to interact and get into it. So it's almost like a virtual meeting space. Oh, okay. um, but you can kind of collaborate inside of the the model, and I don't know, there's a bunch of cool stuff like that. Um, that sounds really cool. I've been actually you, seeing a huge uptick in that though since the adoption of online meeting rooms. I've seen people using Minecraft, Red Dead Redemption. Um, there are people using like Sims games and stuff like that to to hold their meetings in because it makes it more interactive or. Um, you remember the oh. Mii players, like the Wi-Fi, or what was it? The Not Wi-Fi. Uh, um, Nintendo Wii. It's the Nintendo Wii, and you had, like, the Mii players. Yeah. They'll have, like, little avatars like that and create, like, a little virtual meeting room to go and sit in, and you can walk around and get coffee and stuff. <laughs> this is Pe it's interesting. People are getting uh, desperate. I've uh, heard of people playing uh, role-playing games like D&D <laughs> and Blue Beam Studio. So I'm just saying, man. Dude, they're getting creative. They're, they're getting, getting creative. creative. That's what that is. Yeah. Heck, yeah. Can't co we can't be in the same location at the same time. So how are we going to do this? Yeah. <laughs> so everybody gets a little creative. You know, they figure out their favorite environment and they, yeah. uh, they you know, Run get online. It. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I mean, everybody's using, you know, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, uh, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's think outside the box. What else we got? Yeah, I like it, man. I like it. All right, everybody jump in Call of Duty. We're all going to be on the same team. <laughs> We're going to talk strategy for work, all right? <laughs> 10 o'clock. Now, what were you saying? What are the meeting notes? <laughs> <laughs> That's the meeting I want to be in, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll be, yes. Put, sign me up. Put my right? name on that me one. Me too. I'm down oh, for that. Wait, so. right? <laughs> um. So, oh, so the wild though, like they came up, they have that great idea for that. But also, so I went to, um, I don't know, you, you know, Kevin Lask, uh, we did this uh, presentation for, um, the subcontractors association in Chicago and Mortensen construction generously hosted it. So we, you know, gave this kind of after hours presentation over BIM technology, all this fun stuff. Uh, Mortensen in their Chicago office has a, um, uh, an HTC headset set up, um, you know, they got the sensors mounted, all that stuff. But what it does is it allows you to interact with the space. So they did it specifically for like a medical, uh, medical facility. And you can like grab like hospital lighting and move it around. You can interact with like trays and, and all that stuff, you know, furniture in the room. Um, and it's just so that you can, or, you know, the, the owners can actually like conceptualize the space and see, yeah, yeah, this is enough space for me. You know, this meets, you know, my standards. This is, you know, and it kind of allows you to, you know, get, get buy off on, on it before you, yeah. yeah, yeah. Before you get there. Well, it was built on unity, the, the stuff they did. Um, so seeing what the wild did, um, it was also built on Unity. It's pretty much the same thing where you can interact with the spaces, you can, uh, move stuff around like yeah. um, I don't know. It allows, it's, it allows you to just kind of do this like simple push from Revit to uh, to it. And my favorite part about all this, they have a BIM 360 integration. Oh, there you go. I'm a sucker for BIM 360. I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'd imagine it's as the model updates, you'd get yeah, that's it. updates yeah. to the rendering or to the uh, well, the reality, well, so like the model I itself. Mean, I say integration. I use this term loosely. Most of the integrations that happen on BIM 360, they're they're not necessarily uh, integrations as much as they are um, file sharing capabilities. So mm -hmm. you're connecting your folder to their folder as this folder updates. It updates in their system. So they still have their own folder structure. Yeah. Um, and and all it's doing is it's just replicating from here to here. And as each one that gets updated automatically 
you know, and vice versa. Yeah, that's okay so, with me, man. As long as they're getting updated, you know, you don't have to drag and drop or you're not ver- manually versioning, uh, you know what I mean? That stuff is, is mm, for the birds. It's, arc- yeah, it's, it's caveman uh, now. It's I, archaic. I'm not, I'm not calling out anybody's integrations, <laughs> but there's a specific integration that comes to mind where you have to do stuff like that. So, Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Were we doing that one today? No, we're not talking about any of that stuff. We're done. We're, I'm going to call that quits. But uh, <laughs> oh, Yeah, we were playing around with one of those today. Uh, that was fun. Um, they're owned by the same company. I don't get that. I don't know. Eventually. You got to figure eventually yeah. they'll talk. They'll talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's yeah. a project Every, to consolidate. Everybody's got to talk. Yeah. I mean, eventually that's where we want to be. Even yeah. if it's in two separate, you know, places, as you're saying, if I update A, I want B to update because, you know, it sees that A is updated. Once that's there. And, and if I update B, cool, man. You imagine the, that? The letters you used were perfect A and B. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's move on, man. All right. So. Uh, this one actually belongs to a friend of ours. Um, and it's one that I'm probably the most familiar with on this list. And I know it's probably the one that you're most familiar with on this list as well. Uh, and that's Kobe labs. Their Mm -hmm. Revit tools are freaking amazing. They're always adding new, new tools inside of the, the, the plugin, the little dropdown says, you know, like, uh, feedback, it's like feedback to developer or whatever. You got a new um, recommendation, you send it to them, they freaking jump right in and they start banging some stuff out, man. Yep. Uh, it doesn't happen that fast. But if, it, if it's a worthwhile uh, recommendation, um, yeah. chances are it's going to make it in the next release. It's pretty cool. What I love about it is um, they're still d- uh, democratic about it in a way because they, they post up a form and you can actually put up – all of your favorite or ideas for um, new plugins. And then people can go and vote on that. And the ones that get the most votes get integrated in. If they see a lot of you know interest in this tool, of course they're going to add it in. They want their toolkit to be used. They want it to be good. So yeah. they're continuously taking that. I love that about them. I really do. Yeah, and this is uh, Rob Gadba's team. And uh, he's going to be on our upcoming episodes because we're going to chat about Something else that he does. Uh, <laughs> Another I add-in. And, yeah, yeah. And, and advanced work packaging. Um, but there are tools like, so inside of Revit, there's the, there comes in two parts. Um, you know, the first part, yeah, it's more about like finagling data. And the second part's more about managing content. But the, the, um, the Excel kind of update, you know, all that yeah. sort of stuff, you know, editing all the parameters at once, like, yeah. oh my God. That just makes life so yeah, much got, easier. That, that's the BIM query tool. I mean, yeah. I get in and edit all of the elements, parameters, not just type parameters, instant. Well, it, it is really a lot of the type and instance parameters you can get into and edit those for any category inside of the model, um, pulling up all the information there, and then also importing Excel spreadsheets. So there's another one on our list we're going to talk about right after this um, that, I, that I feel like has a, a good connection on this as well. But it's pretty big for us to be able to bring in an Excel spreadsheet and connect it to our model. Like, and, and then in this sense, the uh, Kobe Labs, you import Excel spreadsheets and you can import them for schedules. You can use them for schedules and yeah. kind of adjust what you're seeing inside of that schedule. Or if you use the BIM query tool, you can actually export that as an Excel spreadsheet, ad- adjust anything in the Excel spreadsheet, bring it back in, and it updates those elements. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. remarkable, man. Um, it is. So- I like fudging stuff in the in the schedules, right? Not everything ends that that yeah. we want to be on a schedule ends, you know, is in the model. So we well, got pretty. Revit doesn't do everything that we need it to do yet, right? So what to... software doesn't do every? Whoa, this is no. <laughs> breaking hearts. Oh. Um, <laughs> seriously, you know, we, we got to find things that ways to get around it, workarounds, right? That's that's really the key term. I mean, I. I People talk about workflows and things like that. It's it's really workarounds. <laughs> what can you make the program do? How well, we're can... talking about plugins. These are all workarounds, yeah. guys. Yeah, These are things, things are. that the program doesn't do. These are your yes. workarounds. Yep, exactly. So we got to work around that obstacle and and really fudging it sometimes with an add-in. That's what you got to do. And I mean, that's going to get you the results you need and you want them in a timely manner. Now, of course, we want everything to be in the BIM model, but sometimes it just can't. And you gotta you gotta push that information into yeah. it and say no, this is how it works. 
so, sometimes that information lives on Jerry's spreadsheet on his computer. <laughs> I mean, you you, you got to get it in in your your model somehow. It's got to end up on a sheet. So how are you going to do that? Let's uh let's put in the schedule. You know, get it that way. Not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the you know the family updating tool though the oh, parameter yeah. updating. Yes. So if you want to update the the attribute parameter information for like handover purposes for you know it's part of your you know um your delivery like that that to me saves hours not not like i'm not saying like five hours i'm saying like 20 hours like it saves so much time to be able to do all that at once just grab everything all at once and and just knock it all out right then and there yep well yeah dude i'd say adding the shared parameters creating custom shared parameters and pushing the data into families or into categories of families at once is a fantastic tool saves you a lot of time also they have an actual upgrade families tool so a lot of times when you upgrade your families you bring them in and you know, you, you might bring in like five or six of them. I, I, one big thing, man, it's so annoying to go from Revit version to Revit version and have to upgrade your entire <laughs> library. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So you're like, all right, we're gonna try to do these in groups, right? But Revit doesn't really like to let you like upgrade those and walk away, right? It won't let you or keep working essentially. Yeah, you, right? gotta you gotta walk, walk away. away. You gotta turning. walk away. Never mind. Yeah, you gotta walk away because there's nothing that you can do at that point. Um, with the upgrade families tool, though, um, they allow you to grab an entire folder or a selection of families, and it's actually running in the background, upgrading all of those families for you. I really like the functionality of that tool, man. It, being able to also import or export whole fa- whole groups of families into your project and out of your project into a library. Let's say you bring something in from Revit City, you spend some time on it, you know, adjusting the parameters, making it exactly what you want. You want to save that. You can export it out into your custom library and then import that into your other projects. So it's it's a nice nice kind of feature. I like the uh, you know the I guess the biggest thing for add-ins that we really look at is um, what, how much time is this going to save me, right? It, it's it's about it's not about just fudging it, but actually about saving time too. Like that's really what I'm looking for. Yeah, I want something that's going to help me fudge things a little bit, but at the same time, it's got to save me time to do it. Because if not, then it's not even worth it. Yeah, like there's some nice things, uh, you know, in in a lot of the the plugins that I see that are like, oh, I wish Revit could do this. It wouldn't really save me a lot of time, but it just seems more efficient mm-hmm. if you could do it this way. And they'll, you know, they'll do that. Um, you know, but but getting back to your point though, if it like literally, you know, I'm not talking minutes, but like saves me time, like yep. saves me some serious time. You know, saves every you know every drafter designer. An hour a week, it, it's worth it, right? You know, yep, that's definitely, I agree. definitely I worth agree. it. Um, oh, pardon me, man. Beers make so me burp up. You're all good. Me too. The next one I wanted to talk about um, was actually the DI Roots sheet link. I yeah. thought that was a fantastic tool as well. You know, we were kind of talking about the uh, integration between Revit and Excel, and that's still needed. Yeah. It's still needed. And I mean, being able to like pretty much automatically sync your model data back and forth between Revit and Excel. I'm not going to say automatically, but it is very, very quick. Very quick. I, I can't remember. Is SheetLink the one that they give away for free? Uh, SheetLink. Actually, I think it is. Free download. Yes, it is. Yeah. DI yeah. Roots, man. DI Roots. They um, are they, awesome. They're they Dynamo awesome. stuff. Like, they're, yeah. Yep. Yep. Those, 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 uh, the team over there, you guys are great. Um, keep up the good work. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it seems like their sheet link though is a bit more dynamic. It seems like it's a bit more integrated. It is, um, and it has a Google Drive um, integration. You can filter parameters by instance, type and read only. Um, they have extra drop down like parameters um, that you can add in, I guess, or are they the support more of your drop down parameters so you can specify like what elements you're looking for, things like that. It's um, it's, it's, it's pretty nice, actually. Cool, Very cool, nice. man. Yeah. Um, and then you brought up this other one. I'm not familiar with this one. Uh, Optimizer Tools View Creator. Yeah, so I got this one on my phone, too. Um, I, did some, I did some researching on my phone and on my computer today. So the Optimizer, uh, Optimizer Tools View Creator, it really allows you to, to essentially, like, duplicate or create a bunch of new views with detailing, like, uh, really quickly 
Okay. And for for detailing in the industry, for creating these views or sheets, a lot of times you guys are going to know we can't really duplicate sheets, right? And duplicating views is is cool, but if you need to duplicate a bunch of views at one time, gosh, it takes so much time to be able to do, go through, duplicate, rename it. Um, the optimizer view, optimizer tools, I'm sorry, optimizer tools view creator, I saw as a, as a, a very good tool to save us some time as we're going through and, and needing these different views and duplicating them and adjusting their properties. And of course, you can apply view templates to them. Um, you can duplicate them as dependent views or as the um, duplicated with detailing. And then it's very quick and easy, like I said, to rename those views. Well, they get uh, five out of five stars. So um, it's gotta be, gotta be definitely worthwhile. Yeah. Um, one thing we didn't do is we didn't look at most popular apps on here. Let's see. Uh, well, Lumion. There we go. Uh, sports. Um, yeah. Some of these I haven't heard of, man. Maybe uh, <laughs> worth, worth another look later on. Yeah, definitely. Probably worth another look. Um, you know, I wanted to do like this episode. I know we kind of concentrated a lot on the design aspects of add-ins, right? Well, Seeing what we well, can do. We are talking about Revit. I mean, Revit in my mind is a design tool. Yes, it's a it is. tool, but it is a design tool. Well, see what I'm saying here though is yes, it's a design tool. And that's one of those kind of, I don't want to call it a roadblock, but it is, is it's a, it's an obstacle that you need to get around, right? So there are construction minded apps, construction focused applications that we can bring in that would make things easier in terms of offsetting our rebar, automatically applying like couplers or anything like that to, to get it ready, get the model ready for construction. There was one today, actually, I saw a clash prevention tool, a clash prevention as you're modeling. It's actually going through and it'll tell you as soon as you model that element, hey, you're clashing with something and you click it and it takes you to it and shows you exactly how you're clashing with that element. Yeah, Fantastic. That's, that's great. That's, that saves you a step in the clash detective capability. So, yep. um, yeah, I like that, man. Cool. Yeah, I, and I think we could definitely do an episode about that, just talking about um, construction minded, right? How we can push these models using add-ins to get that information we need. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, I think as we talk about the coordination process, we talk about um, the fabrication process yeah. Uh, yeah. and the documentation process, there's a lot to be desired there. So Yeah, I agree. So there's, agree. there's a lot of great apps to, to chat that regard. So yeah, I guess I'll agree with you that this one is um, very design-oriented. <laughs> I right. give that. I concede, man. I concede. Um, oh, and these uh, next ones on the list are from Bird Tools. I like Bird Tools. I um, like Bird Tools very shout out to those guys. They uh, would love to get those on the those guys on the uh, the podcast. Yeah. I think we we chatted about that in the past. I don't know where that yes. left off, but yeah, um, yeah. The BIM communication tool. Uh, since mm -hmm. we no longer have this, I mean that's pretty very cool. Key. Somebody yeah. stepped it up. Yeah. Very key. And then, I mean, honestly, it, it, it's great that it allows you to communicate through models that you're collaborating on, even through BIM 360, right? Still keeping that collaboration and that communication that's so key. I know a lot of people are using Teams um, or they're using any type of virtual chat room that they can and they'll just type in. Now, the crazy thing is, I've learned that a lot of people are trying to save time there as well, so they'll abbreviate. They actually have abbreviations for things they want to say, like I'm syncing, it's going to be S, SN or S, you know, anything like that. So they can let everybody else know, hey, I'm syncing, don't do anything, don't sync. And everybody will kind of step back for a second or take a you know quick break to go ahead and let that model update and synchronize. So it's a very key thing that we still need in the design aspect of these models. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I like that, that they have their own uh, uh, text lingo. Yeah, uh, the Revit community for for the communicator app. That's that's great, man. Um, I mean, that's definitely we talk about lean in construction. That's definitely lean in design. We're we're trying to save some keystrokes here, guys. <laughs> yeah, dude, that takes seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to spell it out. I'm good, man. Uh, my motto is if I don't have to spell it, I'm good. But that's simply because I'm going to misspell it anyways. 
Like, uh, I, I don't know if you've read most of my emails, you probably just ignore them, but more often than not, they're, <laughs> they're riddled with typos, man. I, and the stupid thing is like, I double check it and I double check it. And it's not till after I, I press send, I see that or is R A R E or, <laughs> or if, uh, you know, of is if, and I'm like, that's not the button I hit. Oh, and I yeah. just fat, clumsy fingers, man. Yeah. Yeah. For me, oh. it's, I try to type up on my phone. Sometimes, uh, it auto corrects me and oh I my don't gosh. go back and check. And next thing I know, I got ducks or anything like that. Just little weird things around my, around my email. And I'm like, why would it change it to that? Like, I don't even know. Yeah, I no longer send customer facing emails from my phone for this no, very reason. No, I've learned that as <laughs> yeah. well. Like, no, yeah. I'll wait. I'll set up a draft that I'll get to back yeah. when I'm at work. Yeah, I, back to my that's computer. exactly what I do. I start it, <laughs> gives myself a reminder as soon as I log into my computer, it says you have one draft or two drafts yep. or how many drafts you have. I go into my drafts and I adjust and send from there. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know, again, there's probably a million plugins. We're going to get. <laughs> You know, feedback and just, hey, why don't you check out this plugin? Uh, hey, if you know of some, let plugin. me know. I, I want to yeah. look into a plugin that, that'll help me out here. That, yeah. It doesn't seem like it, it changes my workflow too much. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, now, I wanted to talk about the other one from Bird Tools too the oh, tag yeah. alignment tool. That tag alignment tool can save you a lot of time. Um, I, I, you know, you're sectioning and detailing out. And, and trying to make sure that your text notes and your leaders line up the right way and the elbows are aligned perfectly. You know, you might drag them out to where you see the dash blue line come out. And you're like, all right, sweet, I'm good. But that alignment tool, just you can essentially just pick an angle. You pick a location of where you want it to go, and those tags will snap. It saves you so much time. It really does. Nice. I mean, it helps you make them look professional, I think, a little bit more professional. Now that you're talking about tagging, uh, I hate to do this and jump back to Kobe Labs, but they have a tool in there that um, allows you to figure out if things have been tagged or not tagged. Yeah, QAQC. Yeah, oh that's an awesome gosh. BIM like, reviewer tool. How, how many times have you forgotten to tag something? <laughs> so Too many. How many times have you forgot to put something on a sheet? I mean, come oh, on. Too many, dude. There's too many. You know, And honestly, even that one right there you're talking about with putting um, putting views on sheets. There's a way to do a view cleanup with the Kobe Toolkit. And um, again, one of my favorite parts about that, there's so many favorites on that one, but it, it really um, allows you to, it's, well, it's, it's a view cleanup is what it's called. And you can check a box and it'll let you know all of the views that have not placed been placed on sheets, which of course, initially you think, oh, great, cool, I can erase all of these. No, take a second to stop back and think, wait, which one of these views do I need on a sheet? Like, okay, yeah. let's go ahead and read through these. Uh, no, that one definitely needs a sheet. That one definitely needs a sheet. And it's a quick way to kind of check yourself or check the model before you send it out to make sure everything is good to go. And then, again, when you're cleaning up the model, right, you're going to archive it. You're turning it over. You want to get rid of a lot, a lot of that extraneous data, especially if it's a big model. I mean, I, I've been in models these past couple of weeks that – literally there's no content in it like you get into the the views the 2d views there's these these like gnats flying around in here i thought i got away from them apparently i need some deet but they came back with, you from Andy, <laughs> they man. Came back with me um but uh you can gosh i, I almost lost my train of thought there that stinks no, you did lose your train of thought. You didn't almost. You did lose your train of thought. I straight up did. Yeah, no, no, and, and that's fine. I didn't mean to take away from uh, us highlighting the Bird's tool tag alignment. It's just as soon as you said tag, that's what jumped in my head. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, they're tagging. Uh, that, that, we forgot to mention that one. No, um, that's good. I went off on another tangent there. <laughs> it's all good, man. I do. Uh, next up on our list is one that I actually had to explore because I have customers using Inventor. Um, and we were looking for ways to keep category information in Inventor. Um, you know, so inside of Inventor, there's hierarchical, um, there's a hierarchy to your design uh, when you build out these systems um, or components, rather. When you export that and you bring it into Revit, you get none of that. Nothing comes. Not, it's, it, it's not the same. Um, so the workflow was that we ended up doing is just, you know, hey, let's get get into Navisworks and use Navisworks because we and ultimately we wanted to get to point layout and BIM 360 uh, from there. But um, we found this great tool called BIMdex. Um, and what it does is it creates the BCF 
BCF or BCX file, I'm BCF file. Um, and it keeps all that information and imports it directly to Revit. It's quite pricey, but if you are uh, not necessarily designing building elements, but say internal systems for a building that are fabricated, you know, customized components, um, and you want to keep that information, it's worth looking into this because it's going to allow you to bring all that information directly into Revit. It's going to keep all that information that 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 you want to keep. You know, you're not losing it. It's very smart. It's very intuitive, um, and um, you know, it, it's a lot better workflow in my mind of integrating with. Uh, building data rather than bringing in uh, bringing it on to Navisworks and collaborating, especially if we are still in the design phase. So, you know, yeah. post design, let's get to Navisworks. Um, let's figure some stuff out there um, or towards the later end of it. But uh, if we're still early in the design phase, I'd love to see this stuff in Revit. Let's figure it out that way. Yeah. This keeps this this allows that to happen. Well, I honestly like the uh, one of the biggest things about Revit 2021 this year was uh uh, I mean, not one of the biggest, but it, one of the biggest kind of key things in my mind for fabrication. Huge! huge. Uh, prefabrication, fabrication kind of modular um, addition is that um, inventor to Revit link, right? Yeah, We're seeing yeah. more of that. I mean, the inventor information that comes over, whether they're facades, their assemblies, kind of what have you, like a, these separate models, you can bring them in from inventor and, and they are precise. They are awesome like model well, i mean well masses well, that, what happens that's you. that's exactly what it is when we think about revit um and i'm going to put on my surveyor hat for a second um when we think about revit we don't think about it as being exact and precise yeah you think about it as being um good enough you know it's pretty damn close but it's not like survey grade right nope. well it's the same same thing for manufacturing tolerances right so if we're looking at complex uh cladding or um fabrication level stuff, typically that content doesn't come from Revit. Even the fabrication data that we use today, uh, more often than not, it's, you know, it's a third party, it's from Fabrication Academy P, Academy. it's an advanced steel um, you know, design, it comes from Inventor, it's a SolidWorks component, it's Tecla, whatever it is, it's coming in from some other party and Revit, in this sense, almost becomes an aggregator of that data. Yep. Yep. Um, but that said, as we get these more interoperability with these other programs, especially Inventor, I mean, come on, Inventor's got a great engine. Uh, have you ever seen the integration for Inventor with Revit? Um, uh, if you're using uh, InfraWorks and you create a bridge, it uses yeah, the Inventor the bridge, engine the structural to create Revit design. families. Yeah, dude. It's oh my nuts. gosh, man. Yeah. Nuts. Get the thing spinning. Five minutes later, you've got you've got a bridge uh, with all the elements that are Revit families that you can you can push <laughs> yeah. and pull and do whatever you want with. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic workflow. It really yeah. is. Yeah, love it, man. Makes but, me want to get into bridge design sometime. I'm like, ah, you know, I really don't do that, but it's cool. So I chat with a lot of bridge designers, and most are using AutoCAD. Mm -hmm. Just playing AutoCAD or AutoCAD LT. Uh, I'd say probably one of the largest bridge designers in the country uses AutoCAD LT. Um, I, you know, not dropping bombs, but they use their they do their structural analysis in another tool. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, they're just they're just you know limping along with AutoCAD LT or well, that's the way a lot of people are. I've seen um, with bridge design or structural design even. I mean, you're looking at heavy structural design. They're still using um, AutoCAD or something along those lines. I mean, I see some using Tecla, Risa um, along those lines as well. But um, it, it's just because I, I don't want to say just because, but it is a lot of it is because they're used to what they do and they can detail all of those oh. elements. They already have the process well, set. They have an analysis software that runs on AutoCAD. So they stick yeah. to AutoCAD for this. It hasn't updated to work with Revit. Revit, again, it's not an exacting tool. It is an, an amazing tool. Yeah. And there's an amazing workflow, especially if we're talking about bridges, where yeah. um, we, uh, so I think I showed you this a long time ago. They bring in Robot at that point for structural analysis, and they've integrated it in. Yeah, I think, but I think robot still probably needs to be proven to these guys. Like that's a concept that needs to be proven. It's somebody yeah. that's been using the same tool for twenty years. I mean, you've you've got to you've got to sell them that. Oh um, yeah, definitely. Um, I remember having to convince an engineer of Revit for um, uh, what was it? It was like pulp processing or something like that, where we had to <laughs> show them they could get into the engineering and the, you know calculations and you know, change the coefficients and all that stuff. Yeah. 
and uh, like we had to like prove that it could work for that. But uh, it's it's no different on the structural side, especially probably more so. There's probably I mean there's a lot more liability involved. So oh yeah. You, you, you got to sell a different workflow. Uh, I, I showed you this, I think, a long time ago, maybe like five years ago, where I did this thing where I um, I created a bridge in Infoworks. I uh, pushed the surface to Civil 3D, uh, you know, made a corridor, and then I used Revit for the um, for the bridge. But as I updated my Civil 3D and my Revit, you know, uh, I've had two applications open. As I adjusted one, it would automatically adjust the other one. And I know that's something we were actually looking for with switchback, we were, we were hoping switchback would yep. do that with Navisworks, but this actually does this with Civil 3D and Revit. I haven't seen it in probably about three years, so I don't know if it's baked in. Again, I haven't had to touch this workflow. Uh, it's probably about time I start looking at it again, but um, that's uh, that's probably something to recheck out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm actually pretty excited for um, structural Revit. Honestly, just the the um, additions that I've seen through Dynamo, the um, just integration, direct integration with robot structural analysis, the integrations with advanced steel. Um, just I'm seeing it come. So I and you know we. It, it's funny that you say Revit is not precise because it's it's not. It's getting there, right? It's getting better, but it's not. And when I was growing up, and I you know when I was in high school and building trades, um, my high school teacher always told me the same thing that my first construction boss told me: construction isn't perfect it's not precise you know a lot of times it's close enough you know you if you're trying to get eighth inch figure precision, it out in the field damn it exactly that's, that's that's, motto, it is dude it yeah. really was and you know you're out there cutting these studs now i did a lot of like residential construction when i first started and building trades they taught us how to build you know residential houses that we could sell to um kind of help the program for the school right give more scholarships to people and stuff like that awesome program but my teacher would always tell me like, hey, man, you're trying to get eighth inch, 16th inch precision with wood studs like you're come on, man. Like we, we got to be realistic about it. And he's like, and we want to get this job done. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> but it says this. <laughs> I, I have yet to get two pieces of wood that are the exact same size with the exact same curvature. Damn it. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Good yeah. luck. Go to Menards and some of those boards are or Home Depot, Lowe's. You'll get some oh. some boards that are like, man, this one is naturally arced. What can I do with it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm about to start. Uh, I learned my lessons from the big box stores. I'm about to start hitting up some uh, uh, 84 lumber or something or par. Yeah. Or, oh, you guys got par up there. Yeah, par. Yeah, 84 has been sold. Have been gone for a long time. I thought they had 84 here, man. Oh, they might. I mean, when I, when I was growing up in Indiana, we had an 84 lumber, and that was one of the, I mean, those were the, the big lumber yards that you would go to. And now, like, I, I, when I was in Indiana, actually, I'd drive past the old store in, uh, it was by Lakeville, Indiana, and I'd see it, and I'm like, ah, that, that used to be a cool place to go, <laughs> but it's gone. <laughs> 84 Lumber is still a company, man. Yeah? All right, all right. Got three locations right next to me. Nice. Heck yeah. And the lumber Mars yards are the way to go though. Oh well, yeah, yeah, definitely. As long as they they keep their 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 yard clean and and they kind of keep all their wood out of the rain. Yeah, that's what tarps are for, man. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's yeah. it. No, man, and uh I noticed that big problem so I I rebuilt that deck out here and it was all box store lumber, but it was all box store lumber during covid so like everybody was doing home projects and i'm like yeah. struggling to find freaking lumber it's like damn it like and the lumber that i got like it was a beggar's can't be chooser situation <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm having to be strategic i'm like okay well this one's going to be for a deck post and if i cut it off here that curve uh is fine it doesn't matter oh i could run this side through the planer i'm good yeah uh, like i'm just having to be strategic about it it, <laughs> sucked. it, it was you know, it probably added like 10 hours to my freaking, you know, my project just because I had to get creative. Yeah. Um, we couldn't get, um, so we opted to keep the wood spindles instead of getting like a decorative metal. I mean, this is our five-year house. We decided that we're yeah. going to buy some land here in the next few years. But um, we wanted to redo the deck because it was pretty dilapidated. So we couldn't find the wood spindles though. And uh, we weren't going to spend the money on the metal ones since we're, you know, this isn't a forever home. Mm -hmm. um, the wood spindles that we had originally, um, they 
they're like 20 years old, man. They've been here since the house was built in 1998. Yeah. So 22 years. Um, I mean, it wasn't in the best condition. So what I did yeah. is I ended up just, it was easier for me to find a surface planer and yeah. just run them all, or thickness planer, and just run them all through the damn planer, all four sides, every yeah. one of them reuse those than it was to freaking find them and wait four weeks for Lowe's hey, or Home Depot to can, hopefully deliver them. Reuse it. Reuse it. Hey man, I'm right there with you, dude. Yeah. Um, yeah. Reuse it if I can. We've, uh, we're about to start our kitchen remodel right now. We've just been keep getting delayed because, uh, oh, and you know, Home Depot sends us a notification. Oh, your cabinets came in stock, but they were damaged. Uh, uh so we got to reorder them or, Hey, look, your delivery is four weeks, uh, going to be delayed for another four weeks. I'm just like, Jeez. I mean, there's nothing you can do, right? Um, everybody's sold out of everything. We checked out, you know, cabinet stores and all that stuff. Um, that said though, man, like home projects are not, not that fun, man. No, man, <laughs> they're not. It. The next house that I get, I tell you what, I don't want to do anything to, I want to build a house. That's what we're and, doing. And yeah. I just want to be able to chill for like at least a year. It's not going to happen, of course, but like, I mean, I, I'm saying like not do anything to it. You know, I don't want to do anything to this house. That would be amazing. Now, new homes, you know as well as I do, that it's just like getting a new car. You could work out and be like, awesome, and you're good to go. You don't have to make any warranty claims, anything like that. Chances but, are it's not going to happen. Yeah, no. No, chances <laughs> are it's still not going to happen. Claims, but yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, hopefully they give you a two-year, a three-year uh, builder's claim on it or something. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm going to be looking for, man. And I, I'm hoping to get into something more like that just because I've done, I've, I've done I don't want to say so much on this house, but I've done quite a bit on this house, and you realize, like, you're got when you got a concrete saw in the basement trying to cut up a, a slab, cut the slab for a new shower. Like, is this really what I want to be doing? <laughs> probably not, man. No, probably not. God. Yeah, no. Dude, I hear you, man. Sledgehammer down there, breaking it up, pulling out pieces. Like, oh, all right, new we, shower. We, uh, you know, before we had opted to, you know, before we left Oregon, we had this uh, that house that, um, you, you know, I had that house, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we thought we were going to be there for a long time, man. Like we were like, all right, this will be here 20 years, you know, whatever. Our yep. kids will go to school here. Um, once they're done, then maybe we'll relocate, but um, we're going to be here a minute. So um, we sink a lot of time and money redoing it only to freaking sell it. So now I'm at the point, I'm like, all right, I know I'm going to sell my next house too. <laughs> yeah. Let's not go crazy. You know, let's yeah. add the most bang for the buck and, and figure out the best price, you know, you know, figure out what that potential price is and I that we could get without pricing us out of the neighborhood and yep, all that yep. stuff. So I think where we're at, you know, we're going to redo the kitchen here, maybe update some bathrooms, slap some paint on some stuff. Maybe next year we'll uh, yep. do some landscaping, but we ain't going crazy, man. I'm done. Like I'm. Yep. Same thing. I'm thinking here, man. I'm like, I'm going to put some carpet downstairs. I'm going to put a closet in the bedroom and, you know, just a couple flooring things, paint here and there. And I'm done. Like oh, actually the front yard, I leveled yeah. it out before I left, so I got to grass seed it and landscape it. Yeah, that's Other next end. year. It's too late in the season. That's yeah. it, yep. Yeah. So that's actually one of the smartest things you can do is uh, drop some carpet down there, man. So, like, um, you'll be amazed at how different, like, a room looks with new carpet. It's just, it's night yeah. and day. Yeah. And it's so cheap, too. Like, uh, Home Depot, they'll hire somebody to install it or Lowe's or wherever if you spend X amount of money like I think it's over 600 bucks or something I don't remember what yeah. the minimum is but it's something very minimal they'll come in and, and install it all for you haul the old one away no problem heck yeah heck yeah that'll be yeah. nice yeah you so know we, that's actually another thing um, like we've been trying to look at and you kind of called it out right there is uh, you want an ROI for your time and your money on the on the house that you have like me I'm like, all right, you know, we're going to be in this house for another year, two years. I'm, I, we, so we've been talking about moving back to Indiana, obviously, after our last trip, how awesome it was to be around family and things like that. It was pretty huge. Yeah, um, you miss mosquitoes and snakes oh, and yeah. <laughs> the cold and the extreme heat. I know all the things you miss, man. Oh, yeah, dude. Oh, God. Things Oregon doesn't have. Things Oregon does not have. Uh, I wish I wish I could just take my entire family and like move them here and get the cost of living here. That oh would, my god, that would yes. be nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, 
gotta pay for for uh paradise man i'm just saying yeah no you're right you're, you're right yeah. yes you do it's it, it's it's worth the cost i would say you know it's worth the cost to live here i would pay this to continue living here but i want more family here like yeah <laughs> if i could have but, somebody watch my kids more often that would be fantastic that's where we were man so we had <laughs> two kids uh after the second one it was just like all right we're uh we, we gotta figure this out we get we see our <laughs> our family twice a year yeah um you know, eh, it gets a little tough. And then, you know, we didn't really hang out with everybody all the time. We were always like doing family stuff around the neighborhood. I loved my neighborhood. It was a great, great place to live. Um, but I, I think we really bought at the right time, man. We bought for 300 and sold for like 450, um, just like four years later. Awesome. So like yeah. it worked out pretty nicely. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'll get that same ROI here, but yeah. we were talking about ROI and, um, uh, it's all about just making sure that the money that you're putting in is, you know, one is, you know, how much comfort is it going to add to the time that you're going to live there? And then after you live there, um, it. is it actually going to you know, add to the resale value of the house or is it just, or is it just a preference of yours? So you got to figure out these things, um, you know, value engineered, if you will. Yep. Yep. Well, it's um, funny, yeah, but so. I actually went through, you know, I, I told you guys there a while ago that I had the GLS scanner. And I went through and I've, I've been creating a model of my house. And that's kind of where I'm at is, is trying to figure out, okay, how much will it cost me in materials to do this? And how much will it get me back in a return? Obviously, I know this room behind me here doesn't have a closet yet. It's a bedroom my daughter uses. You know, we have a couple hang-up poles. If I build a closet in that, it automatically kind of has a bedroom. A bedroom. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then it's going to increase the value of this house exponentially there. You have right. a full bath downstairs, so yeah, man, that works exactly. out nice. Exactly. Yep, that's what I ended up. That's one of the big reasons I wanted to put the bathtub or the uh, the the shower down here. Now I have a full bath and and a, and a bedroom, um, and a second kind of living room down here. Or um, I was thinking about recently just building a little wall here, like a little L shaped wall, because uh, you walk through an opening into the living room, and then there's a door here for my daughter's room. If I just build an L-shaped wall there, take it back, then I could put a door into the office and then have a little kind of nook that the bedroom goes back into. Again, further building a little bit of value, you know, with the house, because if you want a living room, you want an office, anything like that, you now have it. Because we have a living room upstairs. You can convert this room to an exercise room, you know, office, whatever you whatever you need to, um, just adding a little bit more value in, into the house. And yeah. honestly... I see that with uh, with BIM in itself, right? Where this is kind of funny how it's all wrapping together, but w with add-ins, right? You want to get your ROI. You want to know that this is going to be worth your time with BIM models themselves. Look at you tying it back. Look at that man, tying it all. You're together. a pro. Woo! With BIM itself, man. I mean, with something uh, like s stuff we were using. Uh, lately we've been um talking about doing takeoffs right and, and takeoffs right from the bim model and kind of figuring out what this material is going to cost us and aggregating that to say okay um it's am i going to get a return of investment here how am i going to do this here you know and and being able to take that data from your bim models or using that it's it's all over the board right the roi has to be there yeah like analyzing that data and getting like i'm doing with my house i'm going to take my house put it into Revit and say again, how much is it going to cost to do this much drywall or these new ceiling tiles, these new studs? You know, well, you get to tie it in a little bit with GIS too because you get to figure out the uh, the demographics of your not the demographics of your neighborhood, but the uh, well, I guess it falls in the category yeah, of demographics. But you can find the financials, the financials of your neighborhood where you can figure out what's the average price per square foot on the lot type and all that sort of stuff and figure out, okay, well, if this type of finish of house with this type of square footage and this money of rooms gets me this, you know, $200 square foot, whatever it is, um, if I, you know, can get there with my house, it's gonna give you that same ROI, you know, ideally, right? Yep, you yep. Know, it's, a, it's a market, we don't know this stuff, we can't predict it, we can't guarantee it, but. No, no. Um, but it's something that you can look at and, and kind yeah. of analyze and say, okay, yeah, base. that makes sense, yeah. It's a good base. Oop, yeah, I like oop. it, man. We're. Um, we're uh, so next house though. We're we're gonna build, dude. We just yeah. I'm building too, dude. I am so building. I had this I had this crazy idea for Adrian. Like I've been thinking about what I want right for a house, and I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm still going all out hippie, and I want a greenhouse attached to my house. 
I want to do aquaponics somehow into the house. That would be amazing. But I had this idea um, earlier in the week, and of course she told me I was stupid, but I thought it was cool, um, is to actually take the house, like dig it down a little bit, you know, dig your, your, your footings, like let's say six, seven feet in the ground, and then take up um, some concrete columns in different areas. But if we could dig it down and actually put glass all the way around, not maybe not all the way around, but partially like a curtain wall underneath the house type of thing. Right. So you not, can actually, see the rodents underneath your house? No, actually. So take away the dirt, you know, things like that a little ways, maybe bring it down. We'd have to figure out how to slope it away. But I would start the house higher up off of the ground, essentially, is what I'm saying. And what I'm thinking is you could have a atrium or a walk-in area, uh, almost a greenhouse, except it wouldn't have top coverage, of course. In this sense, it would make sense for anyone that's not able to get a lot of sunlight in their area. They could take lights like LED grow lights, all the plumbing, all the electrical work, everything would be running most of the time if you have a ranch-style house underneath the house. So it makes sense to just reuse everything, point it down, and have an area that you wouldn't normally use like a crawl space or something. Give yourself seven, eight feet of a crawl so space. Make a basement essentially and make have a that basement, your... have a curtain wall and, and yeah. put a grow room. Maybe Greenhouse, have part yeah. of it as a garage that could go up towards the house, you know. And I, I'm gonna say with Adrian, that is a very expensive <laughs> idea. Oh yeah. And not not the best use of money. But, no, uh, no. <laughs> she she shot that that one that one down real quick. I was like, oh man. Just tell Adrian, <laughs> you know, plus one for yeah, on her side. Yeah. She's like, why don't we just put it uh, like right outside of the house? You could walk out. A lot cheaper. Know, I'm just gonna say, you know. Oh yeah, exactly. You know, we yeah. talked about it and I was like, Yeah, you're right. Let's just put it Dude's outside. Lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I have, you know, when you start talking about the glass floor and stuff, I have seen some like um, lead buildings where they had um, uh, water. So they had like a glass panel that was water was flowing through it. Mm -hmm. And it was helping cool the house. That's cool. Yeah, it's pretty slick, man. Yeah. I wanna actually, for mine, I want to I want to reuse a lot of rainwater and water that we get um, to use in the greenhouse. Of course, I want water, like rain barrels and stuff like that, but actually- it Makes sense, dude, you're in Oregon, but that said, oh, it rains man. here more than it does there. Yeah, you know, that's funny, it does. Like when we were in Indiana, it the thunderstorms that you get, oh, uh, torrential downpours, like rain hurts there, it hurts. You don't walk outside because it like smacks you when it yeah. hits you. In like, Portland, okay. it's, it's a mist. It's a mist. It's just, <laughs> you're just walking around like, cool, I put my hood up, I'm good. Yeah, you're going to get a little wet, but it's not that big of a deal. It, it reminded me of rain in Hawaii, like, except for the sun was shining more in Hawaii. But it was just <laughs> like, it's, you know, nice outside, except for there's this mist where it, you're, you're getting wet, but it's like, is it a big deal? Yeah, probably not. It didn't feel like a big deal. In Texas, like in Indiana and Pittsburgh now, um, and when I was in Texas growing up, your, your windshield wipers couldn't keep up with your damn freaking with the damn rain. It's like you got to pull over because it's, it's getting not too much. Be you can't see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've never had that here. Yeah, no, me neither, man. Never, never, not once. Uh, I've had other issues where people don't know how to drive in half an inch of snow. But that's <laughs> that's topic for another discussion, man. <laughs> that's the truth, man. That is the truth. How did you slide and hit that wall? There was like snow on the ground but it's in a three inch by three inch spot over Dude, there <laughs> in indiana i use slow i use snow to stop you use snow to slow down like you're on ice and it's like yeah. okay let's just steer off into this fresh snow Find here the friction yeah get, get into this powder here <laughs> yeah it's, it's dude. absorb me a little bit yeah yep 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 yeah man i i hear you bud uh there's one more on our list though but that i wanted to chat about that we got off on all this Tangents. Tangents. Oh. And this is like, I leave this one for last because I don't really consider it a plugin, even though it, I guess technically it is a plugin. Yeah, it's a free it's plugin. Good. And it, it's included with um, with Revit. If you have a subscription software, log in your manage.rs.com uh, portal, make sure you download it. It's DB Link. Yep. Yeah. And for me, um, you know, Having to have do, having to do stuff for FM stuff where we were pushing 
like data externally, say Kobe or whatever. There's Kobe toolkits. There's all this stuff. But if you wanted to have a better handle on your data, be able to manipulate your data, uh, DBLink was a great tool. Um, you could push to access or, or whatever you needed to. Um, but the biggest thing for me was I wanted to push to Power BI. Yep. And uh, before BIM oper oper interoperability tools, um, this is what we used to do. We would push to um, DBLink, save it, you know, save our Excel file, post it to the dashboards to Power BI, and away we go. Um, we share that with everybody. They get updated. It was a cool workflow. This is not a workflow I've played with yet in BIM interoperability, uh, but I know that there's, um, there's a, you know, you can create the Excel reports and then push those. So I'd have to play with the Excel report and see what, what they have in there, but yeah. uh, I imagine it's pretty similar. No, yeah, dude, I'd imagine it's it's very similar. Now, I know you and I have had some good experience with DBLink. We had a, a person um, actually out of Pennsylvania, I thought. Um, they were using DBLink to pull like a catalog um, for their different electrical elements and um, pricing and information. They were pushing that through DBLink. They were building like the different types, element types and properties with it so utilizing DBLink from a manufacturer's kind of specification that they pulled from Excel. Yeah, I don't remember which one that was, but uh, that sounds very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it was, line, it was a pretty cool workflow, man. It, yeah. It's pretty cool creating these smart worksheets that you can, or databases essentially that you can link into your project. It, it, it's it was a it was a very cool workflow. Now we're seeing a lot of, um, I mean, I see more of Fabrication Academy pulling in the catalogs there and having a lot of the information already built in to yeah. convert, you know, design over to fabrication elements. But well, I still yeah, think that's a pretty cool workflow. There's still some stuff left to be desired with the Fabrication Academy P workflow uh, because the Fabrication Academy P workflow doesn't uh, allow us to push and pull all all data yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's where Dynamo comes in comes in handy and allows us to um, uh, you know fix that. But you know the easy way for me is still hey let's push and pull DB Link and figure it out. Yep. Yep. But I agree. yeah, I mean that's that's it, guys. Uh, for the the Revit plugins, I, mean, I don't really have anything else I wanted to chat about. <laughs> you know, about you on the DB on the uh, plugins. Did you have any other ones? Oh, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, we could honestly go on all day about these when we start looking at different aspects of Revit and what you can improve with with uh, different plugins. There's so many things oh, out yeah. there. Especially as we talk about construction, as as we talk about pre-construction and estimation. Yep. As you talk about, like, I mean, there's there's a Discipline lot of different focus, things. Stephen. Oh my, exactly, exactly. Um, I just wanted to like, I figured, all right, if we're gonna do an episode, we gotta set some parameters. One, it has yep. to be kind of like vague um, Revit plugins. Yep. We can't yep. rank them because, you know, again, it varies by industry, it varies yep. by yep. Um, uh, by personal preference, by all kinds of things. Uh, by bias, obviously. Cost standpoints. Cost, all that. cost standpoint. Yeah. There's so many things we have some to look of these, at. Some of these that we mentioned aren't cheap. Yeah. Uh, some of them are free. So, I mean, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Yep. Uh, and three, we had to exclude um, uh, plugins that are that you, you can only buy through um, resellers. resellers. Yeah. We, we didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. There are resellers that have amazing plugins. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, I just don't think we could be fair. No, to yeah. be fair. To be fair. So <laughs> keep an eye bias. If you guys have your favorite plugins, you know, uh, point them out, all that sort of stuff. I did want to highlight, though, um, there there was this article on LinkedIn. If I find it, I'll put it in the write-up. Um, and it actually had a ranking of, like, the best Autodesk plugins. I don't know if it was specifically uh, product. I think it was all Autodesk plugins, and it had, like, a ranking of them. Um, and our friend Rob Gadbot was on the list, so that was just pretty cool. That is awesome. And actually, uh, for everybody listening, um, uh, speaking of write up, I owe a write up this week, so I'm going to be uh, putting one out soon. On, I mean, I, I, you know, I drove across country, and I got to experience excuses, 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 excuses. Ah. No, I, I I drove across country and I got to experience some different uh, beers, some different wines or different uh, distillery. I actually got to, like I, I said a couple of weeks ago, I went to Journeyman Distillery um, and I went to Heavenly Goat Brewing in Mishawaka, Indiana. So I got to experience a little bit here and there and take some cool pictures. And uh, I owe you guys a write up on that one. So I'm going to be putting that up soon with some of the pictures from the trip and uh, some uh, some ways that I saw how. Um, BIM is being integrated into brewing. 
So we're not talking about just brewing with BIM, but how we're uh, BIMing or BIMing with brewing, I guess. Or <laughs> yeah, BIMing with yeah. instead of brewing with BIM, BIM, BIMing with brew, BIMing, BIMing with beer. Brew. Yeah, <laughs> BIMing with beer. There you go. BIMing with beer. <laughs> yeah, man, uh, you sent me some of the photos, and uh, I would love to do something similar. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's they're very cool, man. That wallpaper in that bath. I tell you what, yeah. I want that all over my man cave. Yeah, that's gonna be my, <laughs> my new office and my next house, man. My next. House. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's it. We gotta have a man cave in the next cow, the next house. Oh, I don't get man cave, dude. I have an office, and that's the only place I get. Oh, dude, that's gonna be the man cave. That's gotta be it. That's. Gotta I tell be you what, dude. I tell you what. After you work in your home office all day, the last place you want to go to relax is your damn home office, bud. That's 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 true unless you have some like awesome looking decanters and like an old jukebox. I, I leave know. my I purposefully purposefully leave my whiskey down here. And uh, I tell you what, man, you know, six o'clock rolls around or whatever, I, I just can't for the life of me come back down here <laughs> and just stick into it. No. And it's not that I hate my job or anything like that. It's just like I you know, mentally I like to have that separation. Yeah. So if I had like a separate space, you know, it, it'd probably be a little bit different. Uh, but for me, my relaxed space, especially while the weather's nice, uh, I built my kids a new playground, but I built a hammock coming off of that to my new deck. So uh, they're out there playing. I got a beer in hand, and I'm just swinging in the hammock. There now. you go, dude. Relax. That's it. That's one of my favorite parts about camping. When we go up on the mountain, I, I will put up three or four hammocks and just chill. I mean, that's what we do. I mean, you're going to go out to the lake. You'll go fishing. You know, We'll go swimming, all that kind of stuff. And you go back to the campsite. You find yourself a nice hammock spot, nice shade spot, and chill. Let the kids go. They can go explore the woods, take a nap, you know, <laughs> hang out. Just awesome. Awesome. Yep, yep. Let me uh, let me get a, a book and a beer and uh, hang out in the hammock, man. That's about it. Heck yeah, man. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the goal. All right, man. So today's episode should be uh, brewing, beer, uh, brewing, BIM. No, wait. BIM, brewing, and... Beds and plugins. All right. <laughs> that sounds like a very dirty episode, but <laughs> you know what? I'm. <laughs> we are not going to name it that. <laughs> but uh, with that, man, I'm going to bid you adieu. It's uh, nearly midnight in my time, buddy. All right. Uh, it's been a, it's been fun. Uh, I'm out of here. Everybody, on another yeah. episode of Brewing with Bim. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, and hopefully you find these plugins useful. If you want to find out more, we'll send you some links. Uh, you know, do a quick send us some links, send up some feedback on some plugins that you guys are using that you guys see some real value from, and we are always happy to check them out and talk about them. Yeah, we love hearing about new solutions. We get requests uh, probably daily, or if not daily, at least weekly, from uh, people wanting to uh, come on here and talk about their tools. Um, yeah. um, you know, if you got somebody else that you'd love to. Uh, um, that, we, that you think we should be talking to, whether about plugins or processes, let us know. We'd be happy to get in touch with them and see about scheduling something. Definitely. So, uh, till next time, guys. Um, stay hydrated. Cheers. <laughs>